You know, when you have spent all your life as a, um, a Christian language, I could, I could say as a sinner, and you are, you are, you became old, you are old like me. And uh, is, you know, what is, uh, what is uh, our hope of salvation? What is, uh, what is the, uh, Pass we we must go through. How is it possible to to be sure that we can uh, go on a spiritual uh, way? How is it possible to to do something? I don't I don't know if if my my question. But yesterday's night night at the end it was the same same thing. You know. You have made all the mistakes in your life, and you are really sorry about uh, your behavior, about many things, and you you have not studied the good things. You have not, and you 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 just made money mistakes, and the, as you say, the your life could be ended uh, at any time. So. What is our hope? Hmm. What is my hope? So, uh, thank you for that question. Of course, all of us are imperfect. All of us have made errors and mistakes. That's part of the human nature. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a very good thing. Because unless you make mistakes, you won't know how to make corrections. And the whole nature of nature itself is fallible. It's full of flaws and ceilings too, if you want to ha have a pun about it. So the human body is uh, a wonderful mechanism, for example. But if you really want to know the ins and outs of it and the details of it, all your attraction and attachment to your body will go. And the Viveka Shunamani attributed to Shankaracharya, Adi Shankaracharya, I know he didn't write it, but many scholars uh, don't think he wrote it, but certainly somebody wrote it and attributed to Adi Shankaracharya. And there you see a wonderful descri uh, the description of the human body that it is, in fact, full of bile, full of blood, full of mucus, full of, uh, we may extend the uh, example, full of bacteria, thousands and thousands of uh, uh, toxic material stuff in the human body. And you see Parik, for example, has decided to go on a three-day fast to eliminate some of these toxins and purify this body. Uh, now, the only thing is this. Purification does not come through fasting. Purification does not come through nutrition. Correction of flaws does not come through ruminating on the past. None of these things will be any in any way corrective action. One, first of all, Logically speaking, ruminating on the past, even five seconds ago, with any kind of regret, guilt, or remorse, will not change what happened a second, two seconds, three seconds, never mind about a day ago, or a year ago, or a lifetime ago. And so one of the most useless things we could do is to ruminate on the past with the question, why? It's much better to say, why not, what next, and move on. After all, if you're learning some new skill, let us say, playing a musical instrument is my typical example, or learning some kind of sport, or let us say painting. Well, let's take painting as an example. You go to an art class, for example. 
And the first figure you make is a kind of stick figure with all kinds of splash of colors called abstract art, possibly. And the art teacher may come along and say, well, my five-year-old could do better, do this. Well, we could take this personally. We could go into a deep depression about it and give up and never attend an art class again. This is one possible reaction. Or we could resolve, okay, let me listen to the guidance of the teacher and let me now repeat the lessons, rehearse it. And the more time I dedicate it, uh, dedicate to uh, honing up and refining my skill, the more efficient I'll be, the more easily I will be able to do it until I then, there's a, some transformation takes place. Transformation takes place when we learn something from the start, we become technicians. When we learn, try to learn spiritual life to start with, we become technicians. These are the rules. Do this, do that, don't do this, don't do that. It becomes something of a struggle, something of an uphill process until creativity comes in. And it's the same way with, you mentioned poetry, for example, and let's take painting as another example. Let's take music as another example. At a certain point, the technical side goes away and an internal creativity takes over. I'll give you the example of these very talks even. I start off not really knowing what I'm going to say. And as I start off, something takes over. Something, a, a kind of internal expression, a flow takes over. An expression of inner creativity takes over. And it touches your heart, even though the words may be faulty or inaccurate. The inner feeling of it gets conveyed. And so we have to take spiritual life in that same way, that we have to get out of the technicalities. And often the technicalities are contained in a set of rules and regulations inherited as a kind of theology, that is, some way of working out what is this thing called God. With some doctrines and dogmas and rules and regulations attached to it. And if we're not careful, we'll be so involved in those rules and regulations that we'll forget about why we're even doing this. So spirituality takes place, real spirituality, or spirituality takes place when growth is such that we take personal responsibility for our own actions, for our own inner life, and we start enriching it with an inner journey, a mystic journey. And real, real, Spiritual practice means creating a sense of intensification every day. That is, one's concentration increases every day. We're no longer comfortable with the status quo. The day-to-day -day status quo it becomes routine. Well, then there's no advancement. Unless we learn to paint more and more and better and better every day, what's the point? You see Pablo Picasso, a very famous, as you know, very famous artist and incredibly talented, a genius, there's no doubt. Certainly by the age of very early age, let's say 12 years of age, he was already painting in a classical style. But when people look at Picasso, they no longer think of a classical style. He's influenced by other creative influences, such as, for example, masks, uh, from uh, Polynesia, Africa, and so on. A, a, a different kind of raw energy. And he says, I spent my whole life, I, I, I learned how to play, to paint after the masters. And then I had to spend my whole life learning to paint like a child. Getting that simplicity, that spontaneity of expression, so that I work with a blank canvas, not knowing what's going to arrive and create a form with as much skill as I could ever do, and yet integrating all the figures in such a way 
that we don't wonder whether people appreciate it or like it. It's my expression. So in the poetry, I don't know if I'm uh, skilled or not. It doesn't matter whether it's good or whether it's bad. The fact is that I'm not doing it for you. I'm doing it as my own expression. And so at that moment, creativity takes over. So there's one thing that we are sure of. Yesterday's lunch we cannot change. Yesterday's thought we cannot change. Five minutes ago is unchangeable. But what we can do is, instead of asking why, we can ask why not what next and put something into this very moment, this very second. Repeat it, repeat it habitually. Elevate the mind continuously. With a new second, we have an opportunity to put something joyful in. Now, if we're concerned with the theology of sin, that's not going to happen. And whatever your thinking and thought takes place in a sequence of words, whatever words you're issuing, these then enter in deeply into your person. They deeply enter into the unconscious mind. And that becomes, has a pulling power from the outside. It becomes your scene. It becomes tomorrow's people and places and events, tomorrow's drama. So change your thinking. Now, there are two th theological positions, if you want to put it like this. We can more, more likely say philosophical. The one is that we are born in a hopeless condition. We are born after all, screaming and crying. We come out, we're not that happy about it. We were there nice and warm in the mother's womb, we're floating about nicely, hearing the distant drumbeat of the mother's heart, the swirling, and whir swirling of the bloodstream going around the body. We were nice and warm, we were nourished. All of a sudden we come out into the brightness with lots of noise and so on. It's to our advantage that we cry because we have to exercise the lungs. And our life begins, as it were, independently when the, uh, when the cord is cut, the connection to the mother is cut. No longer do we take her nutrition, no longer do we take her thoughts. Now, are we born with a deficit? And then is our whole life a question of uh, hollows, gaps, voids, deficits? and then desperately trying to fill them in and every moment regretting. And we are told by theologians, you see, we are a sinner and the only hope, the only way out is by somebody else from the outside lifting us up. The salvific value of Jesus dying on a cross, for example, and this is the Christian theology. There's a way around it, which is acceptable, but that kind of theology I don't see any merit in. Because the truth of the fact is this, even this theology of original sin comes from the idea that we are eating from the tree of knowledge. Knowledge about what? Knowledge about the world. We are eating the apple of doubt and fear and temptation, but the Garden of Eden represents our natural perfect state. So the other way of looking at it is not that we are born defective and require rescuing, that we are born completely full and free and perfect, nothing to change. We only have to discover what is already there, in which case we don't become past orientated in terms of regret, and we don't become future orientated in, in the sense of hope, which anticipates something will come in the future it's much better to tune the mind in and the attention in to what is happening exactly now. And what we find now, our true nature, is full and free and perfect. Why don't we tune into that? We cannot do it if the mind is occupied by past regret and doubt. And we cannot do it by anticipating in the future that brings us stress and anxiety. All that disappears when our attention is tuned into the glory of the self for what religion calls God. We practice that 
and leave the rest to itself. We insert new habits into the mind. We have an opportunity to do it second by second, with every second being a blank check, never being used. Put something useful in. We have the opportunity to elevate the spirit and become joyful from moment to moment. And don't worry about when will I die, what will happen, how will my karma catch up with me, and all of these other things, because these are opportunities missed. But we can put in the glory of the divine self here and now. And as Joel Goldsmith says, I repeat it time and time again in his definition of meditation. What is meditation? A song of gratitude, he says beautifully, that God is here, God is now, God is love. What a beautiful, beautiful affirmation. We are repeated endlessly. God is here, God is now, God is love. Is it any different from the teaching of Jesus? Not at all. The kingdom of heaven is at hand or within you. It is here, it is now. Don't say it's low, it's here, or low, it's there. When will it come in the future is the question asked to him. No, our truth I tell you is neither not here. You won't find it coming here, low here, low there, nothing like that. For I tell you, the kingdom of heaven is within you. And if the kingdom is within you, the king also is there. And so one thing I brought up last night was the idea that the unusual approach, shifting the mind and revaluing the human body. Instead of saying my body, you can say this is God's city, 11 gated city, said Katupanishad, or nine gated city, says Bhagavad Gita. Same principle is there, belonging to one who is unborn, whose consciousness is unflickering. As long as that emperor is there, then the city carries on nicely by itself. Now, do we have to do some things? So, Oric was there fasting for three days, and in uh, asking him why, he gave a very interesting answer. I live with the nutritionist, we have conversations, I feel good, and so on and so forth. It's all about the human body with probably a sense of ownership. This is my body and I feel better. But a revalued uh, view would be to say, no, essentially I am the owner, I am the resident, I'm the permanent resident of a city and uh, with all the mechanisms of the city, all the highways and byways of a city, the whole process of waste disposal is there, whole unit is there where the city gets cleaned up, health and hygiene people are there, the delivery system is there, transport system is there, taking nutrition by all the trains, the bloodstream taking all the waste products away through the lymphatic system, the lighting system within the city is there, all the electrical impulses, all the neurological in equipment is there, the headquarters is there, the control room is there for the whole city in the neurological system of the brain. All of that is there, complete. And why is it working so wonderfully, so systematically, despite the fact that we put in all kinds of things for the poor Lord to digest? And the Lord never goes on strike, never asks for a wage increase, digest your food second by second, minute after minute, in our system, lifetime after lifetime. He doesn't say, oh, you had something difficult for me, so I need a wage increase. Nothing like that. This is why we say God is love. And if God is love, and we feel, in answer to your question, we feel that maybe our life has been full of errors, then accept it. We are human in that sense. We have a human consciousness. That means we made the error. I am the body, but it's a temporary error after all. And the body working efficiently and so on and so forth will not work as, efficiency, as efficiently if we have negative thoughts, damaging thoughts, or a damaging diet, or lack of exercise, or any of these things. So why should we keep this body healthy? Because we need to make sure it is an efficient instrument in order for us to have 
a revelation of our own perfection within. That's the reason an external instrument is there, not only for our self-discovery, but also for us to fit into our designed role in the universe, for us to be helpful to others, so that we can uh, be part and parcel of dharma. Dharma means from the root, something that holds everything together in harmony. It holds everything together in, together in harmony. The universe is always struggling to hold things in a sense of balance and harmony. If we are to apply this, we need a harmonious mind, harmonious body. We do everything we can because we should take the body as God's temple, God's city, and make sure that the streets are clean, make sure that the waste disposal is gotten, make sure that everything is running well, cleaning it on the outside, no doubt, and also cleaning it on the inside through exercise, diet, and all the rest of it. What about the mind? Cleaning the mind through prayer and meditation, the inner dwelling sitting room of the Lord. Let's do, do some, some cleaning. What are you? I'm a cleaner. Cleaning the body, cleaning the mind, that's all. That's my only job. What makes it solid? What makes it solid is any thoughts of regret. Any thoughts which are impractical, impractical because I cannot change even five minutes ago. It's gone. I have to draw the line and have no regrets. Only with one proviso, maybe knowing that the past was maybe erroneous, then I make every resolution and effort to do better in the future. And that's a valuable thing. Doubt and fear are valuable in their own way, as long as they're not a permanent state, as long as we correct it with a counter movement. So all our thoughts we have to assess and make sure we put in something better, something more positive. That's the way. Now, that takes out, that rules out any external factor that acts as a rescuing or saving body. Saving from what? What are we being saved from? The language is very awkward and difficult. Well, let's use the word saving, saving ourselves from our own stupidity. Well, we can save ourselves from our own stupidity and ignorance by putting in knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is the, is the antidote to ignorance. Wisdom is the antidote to foolishness. We're all fools. We're all clowns tumbling, says Vivekananda. Let's acknowledge it fairly and squarely, that's fine. But let's not dwell on it. You make a mistake, how many times will you apologize? You apologize multiple times, you'll be a public nuisance. I'm sorry I did this to you yesterday. That's no, okay, forgiven. Five minutes later, no, but I'm really sorry. Yes, yes, you said it. Next day, a letter of apology. Yes, yes. Following day, another one. How many times will you do it? Don't you have faith that if you say, I did something wrong once, don't you think that the Lord of the universe accepts it. Do you think the postal system in heaven is all clogged? You think that the Lord of the universe never saw your email? What a funny way we have of thinking. There's a non-judging entity. You see, in the beginning, we may think that God is an external entity, judging, criticizing, correcting, punishing. But pure reasoning will say, this is not a God of love. This is one of the main objections to a theological extra cosmic creator God. How can you have somebody or some entity that says that I am full of love, I am love itself, but at the same time, I'll punish you severely and allow you to burn in the everlasting fires of hell where there's screaming and crying and misery. What kind of love is that? Are we not all children of God? So we find these distortions coming out because there's only a simple reason for it. The basic motivating factor for everybody 
short term, short term, is reward and fear, Hello? reward and punishment. Hello. I, re I reward you with a, an ice cream in heaven, wonderful. What? Or I'll punish you with uh, some eternal fires of hell or something like that, you see. Reward and punishment works, there's no doubt. For children, now, adult children are also there. Why don't people rob banks? Well, I might get arrested. Supposing you say, I trust humanity entirely. Let's take all the security away from the banks. Well, the banks will be empty. So there's every motivation. The idea, the theological idea that we are hopeless and that we require salvation is not compatible with a more accurate and profound teaching that we are full and free and perfect. We don't require saving. We need to express the perfection we already have. Uh, so uh, that was the answer, I think, to your question. But it also incorporated something that Parikh was saying. If we become, we have to be careful not to be God, uh, not to be body conscious, to be God conscious. Because most people, when they fast, prayer goes along with it. Fast and pray. Pray and fast. That goes along with it. Why do people fast? in Islam? Uh, why do people fast in Christianity, Hindus, and all the religions, by the way, in Buddhism and so on and so forth? They do it in order to tune the mind away from the body toward God. And so if that dimension is missing, the opportunity for an extra joy is also missing. Fasting should be accompanied by an increase in prayerfulness. And so I hope that that's what happened over the last three days. Well, I th think that's, uh, that's uh, two issues dealt with. And Charles, I hope that was a satisfactory answer for you. Yes, thank you, Swami. But there is something with, which is missing in my understanding, but I, I, I can't uh, uh, put it in words. Uh, something because you say god is love but why is there so misery so problems so no, things like that yeah but that's an important question of course so the problem of suffering is there it's only there in uh, some of the abrahamic religions it's not there in other systems it's not there in vedanta it's not there in buddhism and so on why isn't it that there? Because of the law of causation, that suffering really is caused by your own actions and thoughts. Your thoughts, your words, and your deeds will crystallize as suffering for you on the basis that there is always a cause. You cannot blame an unsuspecting God. This is a kind of interventionist God, which does occur from time to time, from age to age, there's no doubt. But in terms of moment to moment, the resource of time is an opportunity for transforming what we have into something glorious or otherwise. And so all of the scripture directs us. There are two paths. The uh, path of, uh, the, path of uh, the pleasant path and the path which takes us to, uh, which is a, a preferable path. The preferable versus the pleasant. I don't want to say pleasurable, you see. That's why I'm hesitating a little bit, because it's the pleasant. There are things that we find pleasant. Now, pleasure occurs on different levels. There's physical pleasure. There's mental pleasure, emotional pleasure. There's pleasure in studying. There's pleasure in enjoying art and culture. And, so, and some of that will be preferable. No doubt. On all these levels, there are some areas that would be preferable. But by the same token, if there's any element of egoism in it, egocentricity, selfishness in it, this will bring us ultimately pain. Now, we just know this by pure logic and experience, of course. You know that if you, uh, for example, enjoy, uh, let's say, some special treat or even psychologically if you enjoy praise 
When you don't get it, you're unhappy. When you don't get the food, you, another craving comes up. You have to keep topping up, topping up, topping up. There's no fulfillment in it. Purely logically, it's not a good formula. But the preferable says, wait, there's something deep and profound and perfect that has, that offers a higher joy. Why don't we take that, please? And so uh, we get the consequences of every thought, every word, every action that we have goes ultimately into the unconscious deposit area. And that has a pulling power from outside and creates all the scenes in front of us. So this explains suffering. You see the childish idea will be that there's some God sitting some area, in some area watching you and recording all your movements and judging you on the last day, say, and punishing you or rewarding you. But this is a short-term thing. Now, what is the long-term motivating factor? The long-term motivating factor is to say, let me explore my own individual talents and abilities and express them, express them for the sheer joy of it. Why, what motivates people to paint? The sheer joy of it. What motivates people to write books? The sheer joy of it. Is it hard work? Yes, if you don't enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, it's an arduous task. It's a struggle. I'm doing it, I don't like to do it. But if you are doing it with a sense of joy and enthusiasm and concentration, well then, of course, it's a positive movement on. That becomes a motivating factor in itself. I always remember in Zimbabwe, a wonderful man, he was a sign painter that is, uh, believe it or not, there was an era where all commercial signs were hand painted. Of course, there was a technique of doing it. You take some paper and you make a, you draw out the letters that you want according to the style that a customer wants, the size that a customer wants. And then you put, uh, you, you um, make a punce, that is, you put holes on tracing paper where you do the picture and then you then make a you then can draw the, the letters on the board and then you hand paint the letters he said i'm so lucky why is that because i enjoy what i do and his extension of that was he was a very very good artist and when I say good artist, he would take a, let us say a photograph and he would have the skill of duplicating it in exact detail, using the right blend of colors and so on. It would take days of hard work, but to him it wasn't hard work, of course. It was an absolute pleasure, a hobby. So all work we take with attitude, that's a hobby. Now that's very different from the pushing power, the forcing power of reward and punishment. Reward and punishment is effective when you're a child. When you're an adult, some higher and deeper motivation should be there. The highest motivation, I want to get some freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from limitation, freedom from slavery, freedom from pain, that, that is the result of it. All of that brings pain. I brought this up in a discussion, more like a debate, with the head of the atheists here in Ireland. And his retort was, well, oh, maybe some people like pain. That was his funny answer. No, nobody voluntarily invites pain. Yet pain is a factor in life, there's no doubt. How do we deal with it? So inevitably, the world is as it is because of the actions of humans. 
not because of the actions of an unsuspecting God who has given you all the resources to do better. We have strength. We don't have to make war with it. We don't have to oppress people with it. We have energy. We don't have to ruin ourselves with it as a counterproductive movement. We can use it positively. We can change the, make a transforming effect throughout the whole world. Why not? Okay, Swami, thank you. For me, it's okay. Thank you. You see, sometimes we're ingrained with uh, repeated words of sin, of guilt, that uh, we are hopeless. There's no, we are born with uh, defects. And the only remedy is the salvation of perhaps somebody's self-sacrifice, something of that nature. We don't think like that. So in Vivekananda's language, Ramakrishna also said it, if you see, if you repeat, I am a sinner, I am a sinner, you will be a sinner. If you say I am weak, I am weak, you'll be weak. If you say I'm strong, I'm strong, you'll be strong. If you say I am the infinite, invisible, immortal, that's what you'll be. If you say to this, see another person and you see that they're behind everything is full and free and perfect, is perfection itself, then perfection will shine through. It's called spiritual healing. So it begins with this eternally present current, which we call thought, that arrives at our substation. What we do with it is divided either into preferable or the pleasant. And it's up to us to decide which one. And sooner or later we'll learn that the preferable one is exactly that. Is preferable. See, God is already inside and doesn't need help. So all we have to do when we are faced with somebody, in a sense, in a state of disharmony or distress, is to make the person harmonious inside and put in your own positive expressions, whatever they may be, which are all to do with upliftment and strength. And affirm God is right and God is powerful. See that the person is calm by whatever means you feel appropriate. No doubt you do that. But then first calm yourself down and tactfully, confidently introduce these thoughts of full, fullness and freedom and perfection. Now that works not only in your own case, but in others' case too. More powerful than fasting is joyful, positive thoughts. If you combine the two, fasting with joyful, positive thoughts, then you have the perfect formula. You, you see here in Ireland, everybody's in an upbeat mood. Why? Because the sun is shining. Well, the inner, sun, the inner sun is always shining, but if we don't notice it, we can't blame the sun. We can blame our own attention, that's all. Good, all right. I leave you to cogitate on these words. So we can finish off. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Thanks. Thank you, Swamiji.
Thank you so much.